The history of princely India has many facets to it, which are still waiting to be discovered. Today, we are going to talk about a book from the princely era, which is said to be one of the favorite books of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi when he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. In fact, it is said that he would present a copy of this book to every visiting bureaucrat. Called Minor Hints, it was written by Sir T. Madhav Rao, who served as Prime Minister to the Maharajas of Travancore, Indore and Baroda, and is a series of lectures on the ideal conduct of a ruler. Speaking to us today is author Rahul Sagar, who has discovered a rare original edition of the book Minor Hints in an archive, and which has been republished in his recently released book, The Progressive Maharaja, Sir Madhav Rao's Hints on the Art and Science of the Government. Rahul, thank you so much for joining us today. In your book, you have mentioned that he was one of the most influential Indians of the 19th century, but unfortunately, most Indians have never heard of him before. So who was he and why is he important? Thanks, Akshay. Great question. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and to, to chat with you. Um, so Madhava Rao was indeed one of the one of the greatest figures uh, in Indian uh, public life, political life in the 19th century. He came from a, a relatively prominent uh, a, a Marathi family in um, in Tanjore, uh, and his family had traditionally his his uh, grandparents and uh, had been uh, members of the Tanjore Darbar. But as the Brit as the East India Company, as the British became an ever larger part of uh, life in, um, in the South. Uh, his parents were the generation that switched over to serving the company uh, rather than working in these ever declining uh, princely states uh, like Tanjore, which shrunk uh, immensely. And so his parents were, his, his uh, father and his uncle were both famous uh, public administrators in their own right. His uncle Venkata Rao was actually one of the most famous uh, administrators in India before Madhava Rao. Uh, and uh, he was the Divan of uh, Travancore, one of the first English educated Divans of, uh, of Travancore. And so in that sense, Madhava Rao comes from a, from a prominent, we would say in today's language, prominent family. But he didn't, you know, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth because like most people in his generation, uh, he had to make it from scratch all over again because the old order was collapsing and you had to um, uh, prove your merit, prove your worth in, uh, in a much more competitive and complicated um, South India that was now dominated by the company. So he was one of the first uh, to be educated in English. He uh, did incredibly well in sort of this entrance exam that they had for what was called the Madras High School. His father died when he was uh, 10 and so, uh, and his mother uh, a year before that. So he was an orphan. Uh, his uncle was very famous, but was away. And so he gets sent off to Madras where he becomes the first uh, student in this first batch. And he does exceptionally well. He attracts the attention of uh, uh, um, observers around uh, Madras, South India, and so on. And people uh, start to wonder what sort of career he's going to have. And it turns out to be extremely difficult to be successful in Madras because there is still a prejudice uh, against uh, even English educated Indians. Uh, and Madhava Rao spies an opportunity. There's an opening in Travancore. They're looking for a tutor. They've heard about him because of his incredible uh, success as a student and uh, they recruit him. And so he goes to Travancore rises up the ranks very quickly, makes a name for himself and becomes the Divan in 1858, just as the mutiny is really boiling over in the North. And uh, uh, he immediately enacts a set of reforms uh, outlawing prohibition, uh, prohibiting uh, the maltreatment of uh, what we back then would have called untouchables or the people of the lowest caste, um, uh, demanding religious toleration in various ways. Um, and reforming the economy, which was the thing he was most famous for, uh, building uh, roads, investing in all sorts of infrastructure, opening up trade and commerce. Uh, and all of this meant that in the space of uh, about 15 years, uh, Travancore went, when he took over, it was on the verge of bankruptcy and being seized by the British. It goes from being that to being one of the two or three most prosperous princely states uh, in the South. And from there, his name and reputation, of course, grow. He gets later recruited to Indore, and then from there, Baroda, in both cases, he's recruited because he's seen as 
one of the most uh, successful, if not the most successful person in that century who can modernize a state. There had been other successful divans, but their, their, uh, their motif or their signature was to control costs. They were able to balance budgets by cutting costs. And that usually meant the economy didn't grow. Madhava Rao's great innovation, the thing that made him so famous was that he was excellent at producing economic growth. And when he produced growth, then he was able to use those surpluses from growth to actually advance social, economic, and, and other forms of progress. And hence the title of the book, The Progressive Maharaja, he has this idea that the purpose of states uh, is to improve the lives, the quality of lives, and the, and the happiness of uh, subjects and citizens. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So, you know, coming to the actual manuscript, a minor hints. Now, this is the time uh, we can say the heyday of the British Empire. This is after the revolt of 1857 when the 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 imperial British power was at a zenith. The native states were looked down upon. It was a kind of Orientalism as well, you know, where uh, the natives had to be civilized and all. So in that context, I mean, how how do you see this book? Because here is Sati Madhav Rao, very much a product of the Victorian times with do public good, morality and all. And then he is advising, uh, this is the young Sayaji Rao who would, you know, later go on to achieve the great, great things in his life. So how, how do you see it in, in, in the context of those times, this book? Yeah, I think it's a, I think this book is a uh, Madhava Rao's hints on the art and science of government. It's a testament, I think, to what an entire generation of Indians were able to do when they were given the opportunity to first, in the early parts of their lives, come into contact with ideas and literature from around the world. So they didn't just, they all knew the Shastric texts, they all had read the classics, they all were reasonably familiar with Sanskrit. So they had that grounding. On top of that, they were exposed to contemporary ideas and ideals, modern literature, modern science, especially in, uh, in this Madras high school that they went to. And then the second important thing um, was that they were given in the native states a chance to actually enact what they thought and believed. And, and that was the, the really incredible thing. Had they all served as munshis or uh, minor officials in the, in, in the East India Company or even under uh, British uh, crown rule after 1857, they would, have ha they would really have been able to accomplish incredibly little. There's a whole set of debates in the 1860s and 70s, which I'm writing about uh, uh, a little later, um, which talk about the British debating whether Indians could actually govern well. Should we allow Indians to enter the British civil service, the Indian civil service? And the view was, look, there are not very many of them that are any good. And even the ones that are good are not really um, uh, reliable in one way or another because they're, they're prone to corruption, prone to superstition, these kinds of things. People like Madhava Rao completely disproved those kinds of prejudices. They showed at this high um, you know, the, the, the high Victorian period when race and uh, morality were so strongly uh, propagated by the British, racial ideas or racial superiority, Madhava Rao and his generation really convincingly, decisively showed in the ways in which they governed, whether it was Travancore or Baroda or Mysore or um, uh, some of the other smaller princely states, they showed how it was entirely possible for Indians to be both modern to be both uh, outstanding in, in a modern policy making, running modern economies with trade and commerce and so on. And it was possible for them to advance um, consciously, not by outside pressure, not by uh, uh, guilt or anxiety, but in a very creative, calm, considered way to take the best of the old and the best of the new and forge new identities and new, new visions. And this is really, I think, why we need to remember and revere these sorts of figures, because they, they fashioned a new Indian modernity and they did it themselves. So now coming to the actual contents of the book, especially the main body of the book, uh, why, why is it in form of a series of lectures and what does it like actually teach? I mean, what do these minor hints to the ruler actually contain? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, um, so the, the, the lectures... Uh, the reason they're in the form of lectures is because uh, when Sayaji Rao, so initially till 1875 or 1874, Baroda is governed by Malhar Rao, who's the Raja, who's Maharaja, who's uh, deposed on grounds of maladministration. 
Um, and uh, when a successor has to be selected, the actual more chronologically plausible successor is quietly sidelined and Saiji Rao is deliberately selected because he's young and therefore he can be groomed and shaped. And this is part of the British reflecting on the experience that people like uh, Madhava Rao have been able to accomplish in a place like Travancore. Madhava Rao was one of the first modern educated, actually, if, 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 if chronologically, he is the first of the modern educated in Indian divans who um, served as a tutor, right? He first went to Travancore as a tutor and he has a great, uh, he has great success in training these two young uh, princes. Uh, ILM and, Thir and uh, Vishakham uh, to become uh, outstanding modern rulers who you know, think along the lines we were just discussing and are able to put in place uh, procedures, processes, laws, institutions that encourage all kinds of well-being. So they say, look, what Madhava Rao did in Travancore, we want to do in Baroda with Saiji Rao, but we don't want to rely on Indians let's, because this is the, the, the Victorian, the, the, the morals of the Victorian period coming, coming to bear, uh, we should have these Indian rulers educated by white uh, tutors, by British tutors, who will really impart truly correct lessons to them. And so Saji Rao actually gets a tutor who runs his daily classes called Frederick Elliott, um, whose job it is to train him in English and French and, you know, organize his schedule and so on. And so Madhava Rao, in spite of being one of the most widely recognized and praised, commended figures in educating princes, is kind of sidelined. And as Saiji Rao comes closer to his uh, inauguration, to his to his ascension to the throne, both the British and Madhava Rao start to get a bit concerned that actually this person has been rounded off in all sorts of ways. He has a liberal education. Um, he knows how to conduct himself. He knows how to speak somewhat in public, et cetera. But he doesn't really know anything about governing. And this is one of the first cases in which, along with Mysore, the British have to actually hand over power to someone. It's not just... The, the luck of the draw, whoever you get by succession, you actually have to hand over power. So you feel there's a responsibility that this should go well. So Rao is drafted in to give a set of emergency lectures. He has one year and he has a year in which to groom Sayaji Rao into um, uh, the, the, uh, the art and science of government, thinking about both the laws procedures, but also the personal conduct uh, of uh, of a progressive Maharaja. So the, the lectures have these two components, uh, as the title suggests. Uh, the first part actually deals with the science of governing. What Madhava Rao means by that is something like what we, what we meant by political science in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, you have to understand how institutions run and work. Uh, the emphasis is not so much on democracy as much as it is on rule of law, classical ideas of liberty, uh, why you should uh, treat people impartially, why, they, why institutions should recruit the most meritorious rather than simply people based on their, um, uh, on their community, community background or their uh, language skills or if they're related to you. Um, that, that's not the reason to hire someone. Why you should pay them well. Instead, you know, there was a huge amount of, uh, you know, you can have an office, you have to pay a bribe for an office, you get an office, and then in that office, you're supposed to get your salary by taking bribes from others. Nazars, right? And the idea is that this is not the way you run an institution. It perverts the institution. So Madhava Rao spends the vast bulk of his time discussing this science of government, uh, how and why to create institutions, and also explaining to Saiji Rao what those institutions should ultimately aim towards. And his answer is they should all aim towards happiness because what the classical Indian texts teach us is that the purpose of a ruler is to maintain order. Raj Dharma, the purpose of, of a king, Raj, the, the literature of Raj Dharma tells us is to maintain um, social, political and economic order, stability. And Rao takes a step back and says, yes, order and stability are absolutely important, but what, what gives rise to them. What's the thing that will give you order? Happiness will give you order. Those kingdoms that have been happy are the ones that have lasted the longest. That's one of the opening remarks that he makes to Saiji Rao. So if happiness leads to order, then if you have to fulfill Raj Dharma, you have to make your subjects happy. And so he, um, he then spends, uh, you know, uh, so something like 30 lectures going over the different kinds of institutions you set up. Having done that, he says, you know, your highness, not only, not only do you have to know how to balance budgets and uh, hire and recruit people and how to build courthouses and schools, 
you also have to know how to conduct yourself because there is more to governing than just the science. There's also an art. The art is how do you deal with your own deficiencies and weaknesses? How do you deal with human frailties? Those of your advisors and your family and your friends, they will want to use you. They will want to misuse power. You will want to misuse power or you will um, uh, uh, be overwhelmed by flattery or you will be overwhelmed by intrigue. So I must also teach you how to conduct yourself. And actually it's the second part of the lectures, what Rao called his minor hints, which was really the term only for these, uh, these little pieces of advice, these nuggets of advice about personal conduct. Those are the lectures that Saiji Rao was particularly fascinated by because those were things that he had really uh, not encountered before. Uh, the idea that you should govern well, that you should build institutions, you can get those from books, but lessons about how to, how to conduct yourself that is very hard to come by. That only someone with a great amount of experience and expertise in the Indian context can give you. And that figure above all else was Madhava Rao. There was nobody else in, in an equivalent position. Now, coming to the takeaways uh, from the book, uh, what is interesting is, you know, when I first started reading the book, I thought, you know, it was, you know, from a princely order, a very historic, it's a very academic book. But uh, what was interesting was, uh, for me, were the rules of the personal conduct. I mean, especially... Uh, it was inspiring. Uh, I mean, I, I, I especially noted down about how he writes uh, in, in, as a part of his minor hints about always be cognizant of, you know, how a person is thinking. I mean, you never hurt somebody. Uh, uh, make sure that you, you take care of people's emotions. And he also writes that it's a difficult uh, skill to cultivate, but worth it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the, these, the book is uh, peppered with such uh, interesting and valuable insights, which is which are not only for a prince, but even for a professional uh, today. So for you, I mean, what were the some, some key takeaways which you felt were so relevant to today's times? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And this is why Sayaji Rao, when he heard these lectures, when he heard the lectures on particularly on personal conduct, uh, they they really uh, struck a chord for him, as they did for me when I when I read them. You know, I think the the, the most important set of remarks uh, that, um, as a scholar, uh, I have to always remind myself is Madhava Rao's emphasis again and again to Saiji Rao that you have to cultivate judgment, and to cultivate judgment requires experience. And so there's this for me the my favorite line in those set of lectures is when he tells Saiji Rao, look. You can, you know how to write. If you write with your right hand, you will write perfectly. So obviously you know how to form the letters, you know what a word should contain. Now try writing with your left hand. You'll fail, you'll completely fail. Why will you fail? Because the right hand has practice. It has muscle memory, it has training. Your left hand is uninitiated. And so Madhava Rao says in this, you know, this beautiful line, he says, mark by this example, the difference between practice and a lack of practice and let it restrain excessive arrogance from theoretical knowledge. What matters is whether you have practical wisdom. And I think as a, as a, as a scholar, <laughs> I have to often remind myself of that, that things that one might think you know in theory, things that seem so obvious, so clear, why aren't things done this way? Why don't you, you know, do it that way? You have to remind yourself that very practical, hardworking, uh, conscientious, intelligent people um, have to deal with practical challenges, limitations, and realities. And so wisdom lies in knowing how to navigate those things. It's very easy for most of us from a distance to criticize decision makers, executive managers, and say, you know, well, they're doing a terrible job. If it was me, I would do A, B, and C. It sounds easy. <laughs> Not so easy in practice. And that's what I really, I, I always think of Madhava Rao when I ever get, start getting heated about something. I think about Madhava Rao and I remind myself that the, um, that the, the art of governance is something very different. <laughs> uh, and, and only a few, if they really train themselves, are sensitive, thoughtful, careful, and, 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 uh, and, and self-critical, reflective, uh, only a few are able to master it. It's not an easy business at all. So I have been able to get a lot of practical wisdom from this book, and I hope that even our viewers will love this book and get something out of it. Rahul, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us today and sharing your perspectives on Sirti Mother Rao, the man and the book. So thank you so much. Thank you, Akshay. Huge pleasure. Thanks very much.